The Triangle is an extraordinary place to live, to find work, to find a fresh start. It's a place where people come from all over the world to be part of building the future. But in an area of more than a million people, it can sometimes be difficult to find community. We all need that place where we really fit in, where we belong. At Hope Community Church, we understand that it's nice to have somewhere to let your guard down. Somewhere where you can let people in on the real you without feeling vulnerable or judged. No matter who you are or where you've been, Hope is a place you can find people who genuinely want to hear your story. Whether it's a comedy, a tragedy, or something in between. So if you sometimes feel alone in an ocean of people, there really is hope. Hope where you are.
voices in our hearts as we sing this out and profess that God, Father, we believe. We believe. Let's sing this together.
Growing up, there's so much in my life that happened to shape me and give me purpose. There was a lot I couldn't see, but at the same time, I was shown so much. I'm not sure when I actually learned that my dad took his own life. I remember the day my mom sat me and my brother down and told us, and I remember asking questions and only ever getting half answers and deflections. It was years before I learned that he was an alcoholic and that it eventually killed him. Something like that, it really shapes you. Maybe it even warps you a little bit. Life was tough for a long time after that. I joined the army at 17. Part of me wanted to prove that I could do it, but another part of me just wanted to start over. I wanted to find a place with some structure and stability. Maybe I just wanted a place to belong. The Army met a lot of those needs, but at the same time, it was turning me into something I didn't like, somebody I really didn't want to be. Part of me becoming callous and cynical, my language became more ugly, more vulgar. I also began slipping into negative patterns of my own for the first time. I really couldn't stand the person I'd become. It was like a negative reaction to God beginning to work on me. But one day, all that changed. My brother and I had a rough relationship at the time, and he put that relationship on the line and invited me to church. That day, something clicked, and for the first time I realized that what I was missing was a relationship with Jesus. I remember praying, God, if you're the real deal, if this is it, I need you to take these things from me. Everything, the struggles, the calluses, the pain that happened with my dad, and in that moment, time just kind of stopped. And God showed up. My heart changed, my words changed, and those struggles just completely fell away. For the first time, I was excited about the shape of my future. But it wasn't all smooth sailing from there. Six years later, I was deployed in Iraq. But even with my life in danger every day, it was my faith in Jesus that gave me the strength to survive. I was learning to love other people the way God had loved me and how to share that faith with the people around me. It's incredible to look back and realize how far I've come from where it all began. I'm still on the journey and I know I still have a long way to go. But my life is full of hope and purpose. In one amazing day, God shaped my life into something beautiful. And I never want to go back.
Most days are pretty much the same. Not too dark, not too bright. Patterns and motions so familiar, we no longer give them much consideration. But then, there are days that are different. A day that changes how we look at our life. A moment that changes the way we look at our world. That changes how we understand reality itself. Believe it or not, another one of those days may be a whole lot closer than you think. I'm telling you, it is so good to see all of you guys here this weekend. You know, if you're a Christian, this is the best day of the year. This is like our Super Bowl, okay? This is, this is why we celebrate. It's like the best day ever. And, see, it's such a big day. See, that's why we set aside the jeans, you know, and we come out with our happy Easter suits. Because this is a special. Now, next week we'll be back to the jeans. But this week, even you guys, you look like a real church this weekend. And so it's really great to see you guys here because we're going to celebrate. By the way, have you guys noticed as Americans, we tend to celebrate a lot of things, but we don't really know why we celebrate them. We just kind of go with them and celebrate them. I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated St. Patrick's Day. How many Irish do we have here this morning? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, you're a little kind of tame for the Irish. You haven't been drinking that much today. But anyway, um, I don't want to let you down too hard, but I don't know if you know it or not, but St. Patrick wasn't actually Irish. 
He was actually a British missionary that converted much of Ireland to Christianity. That's why the day was established. Now, let me just ask you, two weeks ago when we celebrated St. Patrick's Day, just raise your hand. If you paused and reflected on the conversion of Ireland, would you just raise your hand? Anybody do that? Anybody do that? Yeah, I didn't think so. Raise your hand if you had a few beers on St. Patrick's Day, right? Yeah. Raise your hand if you wore green on St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Raise your hand if you pinched somebody who wasn't wearing green on St. Patrick's Day. Raise your hand if you're, you're now facing charges for pinching. No, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. We don't want to know that, right? My point is we celebrate stuff. We had no idea it had to do with the conversion of Ireland to Christianity. And Easter kind of falls into that boat. It's evolved into a lot of things in our culture. At the end of the day, they don't have anything to do with Easter. Easter egg hunts, you know, that's a big deal. Sometimes Easter parades, new clothes. A lot of people see it as a chance to get away, spring break, go to the beach. Uh, but Easter is a celebration of, of, of a resurrection an event. That's all it is. It's the celebration of one event that took place over 2,000 years ago. And see, that simple message gets lost in the busyness of the holiday. And you may be here this weekend, and this idea of the resurrection, you may be glad that message gets lost. And I'll tell you why I say that. You know, I've been doing this a long, long time. This is my 35th Easter that I've spoken. And I tell you what, I don't think I've ever met anyone who didn't like Jesus, at least at some level. Nobody dislikes Jesus. Now, they may dislike Christians. People like dislike Christians. And they may not like the church, and they may not believe the Bible, but everybody has some kind words to say about Jesus. After all, I mean, he gave us some great stuff to live by. You know, if you've ever been judged, I guarantee you, even, even if you don't know any other verse in the Bible, you've probably responded, hey, judge not lest you be judged. That came from Jesus. You didn't even know that, did you? Stuff like love your enemy, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. See, we love that part of the Jesus story. Here's the problem. For some of you, it's just a little intellectually offensive to expect you to believe, I mean, good gracious, you got your your degree and your master's, to expect you to believe that 2,000 years ago, a man died and then actually came back to life. And you're thinking, you know, as Christians, if, if you could just maybe take that resurrection part out of Christianity... If you could just focus on the teachings of Jesus, if you could focus more on the values of Christianity, see, you would be a lot more comfortable with Christianity. The problem is this. The resurrection is the epicenter of what Christianity is all about. And it's because, understand, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you know what? He was just another great teacher. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he was just another great philosopher. And and we could get our Bibles out and we could go through the Bible and we could just pick and choose the part of his teaching that we wanted to follow and we could go on with our life. But think about this. If he actually did die and three days later he actually did come back to life, well, you know what? we got to take that seriously. As I like to say, if Jesus really did die and come back to life, I want to be on his team. You know what I'm saying? I want to know how to do that because I may want to do that one day. So the resurrection of Jesus, understand, it is at the very center of Christianity. In fact, let me tell you something. We got all dressed up and came to church. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are wasting our time. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we might as well sell these buildings, disband, and go home. Because understand, Christianity rises and falls not on the ministry of Jesus, not on the teaching of Jesus, not even on the death of Jesus. A lot of people have died on a cross. Christianity rises and falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to make a statement that may get me some emails. You cannot embrace Christianity. In fact, let me just, let me just go ahead and put it out there. You cannot be a Christian without coming to terms with that one event. You cannot be a Christian without believing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I'll tell you why. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus could not have been all he claimed to be. See, in his ministry, he said too much. He went too far. If he would have just stopped with, don't judge, lest you be judged. If he would have just stopped with, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If he would have just stopped with go the extra mile, turn the other. If he would have just stopped with that teaching, that would have been fine. But Jesus went on to say that he was God. He said on one occasion, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, seriously, how do you validate those kinds of claims without the resurrection? And I know what the problem is for many of you here this weekend. The problem is this. Everything we know about the resurrection, we get from the Bible. And you're thinking, well, Mike, that's it. I don't believe in the resurrection because I don't believe... The Bible. And this may not answer all of your questions and it may not solve all of your problems. But here's something I want you to I want to I want you to factor into your thinking. And this is sound a little bit heretical, but let me just say it anyway. Christians don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead just because the Bible says so. It's not that simple. 
And let me explain why I say that. The Bible, as we have it in its form, isn't really a book. It's actually a collection of 66 books. These 66 books, and I want you to think about this, the 66 books that make up the Bible were written by 40 different people over a span of 1,400 years. See, I think a lot of people think, oh, the Bible, a bunch of theologians, guys got together in an upper room somewhere and said, hey, let's create a religion. And maybe we can use it to control people, maybe even get some money out of them. What do you do? Let's get on the whiteboard. Let's brainstorm. Well, let's start with God. That's awesome. God created everything. That's even better. Man rejected God. That's awesome. What are we going to do now? How about Jesus? How about Jesus? No, we got to go with Jesus. We'll go with Jesus. He's going to be the Savior of the world. And they wrote this down. They printed it. They began to sell it. And now we have the Bible. No, no, no. It didn't work that way. Forty different writers spanning 1,400 years. Most of these individuals never met, never sat in the same room together, never had a conversation. Most of them did not even live in the same century with one another. And yet, from the very beginning to the very end, the Bible holds true to the same message. It flows all the way through. God created man in his image to have a relationship with mankind. But God knew about relationships. If there's going to be relationships, both parties have to choose to be in the relationship, right? You don't want to be in a relationship where someone has to be in a relationship with you. You want to be in a relationship where they choose to be in a relationship with you. In fact, that's the only way you can have an authentic relationship. So God had to give man the choice. He had to give man free will. You can choose to be in the relationship or you can reject being in the relationship with me. And we know what happened. Adam and Eve sinned. They broke the relationship. Now let me just make the Bible really simple for you. The rest of the Bible is nothing more than an epic love story of God's pursuit to restore man back into a relationship with himself. That's all it is. And that message is consistent from Genesis chapter 1. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth to the very last book, the very last part of Revelation where John wrote, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. That message is consistent from beginning to end. Here's the bigger challenge for you. 24 of these 66 books were written by seven people who either saw Jesus die and then they saw him after the resurrection, or they were friends with people who saw him die and then they saw Jesus after the resurrection. And these people all came to believe that Jesus was crucified on the cross and that he came back to life. And so understand, the reason we believe that Jesus rose from the dead isn't just because the Bible says so. We believe it because of people who lived during that time who tell us so. And their writings, think about this, have survived for over 2,000 years. And now we have those writings. They're called the Bible. Let me just introduce you to some of these writers. The first one, his name is Matthew. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And initially, Matthew, who was a Jew, he wasn't even a religious person. In fact, if you read the story, you'll discover that Matthew abandoned Judaism, sided with the Romans against the Jews, so that he could actually make some money as a tax collector. And yet, over time, Matthew became a follower of Jesus. Matthew saw Jesus die. He saw him buried. He had conversations with him after he came back to life. And he spent the rest of his life telling people that Jesus rose from the dead. And if all we had was Matthew, it would be pretty easy to justify that he just made it up. But there's also Mark. Mark wasn't a Jew. He was a Greek. He lived in Jerusalem. And we don't even know if Mark was witness to, or to the crucifixion or the resurrection. But Mark had a really, really close friend. His name was Peter. You've heard of Peter. They lived in the same town. And Mark was so convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, he took all the notes he could from Peter, and he wrote the gospel of Mark. It is our earliest gospel account. And if you read it, you'll see that Mark believed in the resurrection. And not only that, he even went so far later on in his life to travel with the apostle Paul on some missionary journeys to parts all over the world to spread the news of the resurrection. So you got Matthew, you got Mark, there was Luke. Luke was a doctor. He was really into detail specific. This is what Luke wrote in Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. And he's talking about the events, the life, the times of Jesus. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I remember, he's, he's a doctor. He's really into this stuff. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that's who he's writing to, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been 
taught. So Luke says, man, I went and I found everybody. I, I, tur every, I turned over every stone. I found everyone who had any association, any contact with Jesus. I interviewed as many people as I could. And Luke says, I came to the conclusion Jesus rose from the dead. But not only that, Luke spent the rest of his life traveling with the Apostle Paul. Parts of Europe, parts of Turkey, starting churches. And when they went to those churches, understand the core of their mes message wasn't believe in Jesus and become a Christian. That wasn't the message. The message was this. God sent his son into the world. His son was crucified. He was put in a tomb. And God raised him back to life. That's what Luke believed. How about, how about John? By the way, what was John before he became a disciple? He's a fisherman. He was part of a family fishing business. And after deciding to follow Jesus, John wrote the Gospel of John. Later on, he wrote the book of Revelation. He also wrote three letters to churches telling them that Jesus rose from the dead. And we know from John's writing, by the way, the Gospel of John is the most read book in the world. We know from John's writing that he saw Jesus die, he saw him placed in a tomb, and he hung out with Jesus and had conversations with Jesus after he came back to life. How about Peter? Peter was also a fisherman. He's also a coward, by the way. He's the one after Jesus was arrested, denied three times that he even knew Jesus. In other words, Peter completely abandoned Jesus when Jesus needed him the most. Yet Peter wrote a couple of letters that are also included in the New Testament. And Peter believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Peter saw him die. Peter visited the tomb. And somehow this coward became an actual proponent of the resurrection. And he spent the rest of his life telling people that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus rose from the dead. Eventually, he was arrested for his beliefs. He was taken to Rome. They were getting ready to execute him. He realized that they were going to crucify him. He says, I am not even worthy to be executed, to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord Jesus Christ. And he requested to be crucified upside down, and they obliged. But understand, it wasn't because of what he believed. It was because of what he saw. He saw a dead man come back to life. He couldn't stop talking about it. Now, maybe the most amazing one of all is James, also the most skeptical of the seven. And the reason he was so skeptical is he was actually the brother of Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What would it take for your brother to convince you that he's the son of God? See, I have a brother and two sisters. I could come back from the dead ten times. They are not going to believe that I'm the son of God, right? But eventually, James got there, and he, he, he accepted that his brother was who he said he was. James wrote a little letter, the book of James. that's included in the New Testament. And James became the leader of the local church movement in the first century. But my favorite, and maybe the most interesting one of all, is the Apostle Paul. He wrote about half the New Testament. But understand, Paul didn't begin as a, as a follower of Jesus. He began as an enemy of Jesus. He was a Jew. He felt, really, it was his job to protect and defend Judaism. So he got permission to arrest Christians, to imprison Christians, even to execute Christians. But if you read the story, Paul went from being an enemy of Christianity to being an advocate of Christianity. And eventually he met Peter, and then he met John, and then he met all the rest of the apostles. They told him as much as they could about the life of Jesus, and then he spent his, the rest of his life traveling around Europe starting churches. And the core of his message was that Jesus was the Son of God, and he came back to life. After he was crucified and buried. My point is this. It's okay to show up at church and say, I do not believe in the resurrection. It's America. You can believe anything you want to believe. But it's not that simple just to say, I don't believe in the resurrection because I don't believe the Bible. Because to discount the resurrection is to say that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, Paul, they all lied. It's to say, you know what, I believe they were deceived. It's to say, you know what, I think they had an ulterior motive. The problem is, when you trace these guys' lives, when you do the research, nothing good happened to these guys. They weren't getting big book deals, you know. They weren't appearing on Oprah or Dr. Phil. They weren't making a lot of money off of this whole thing. In fact, they were persecuted, eventually martyred because of their faith. I just got back from Israel. These are the kind of things you learn. Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia with a sword. Mark died in Egypt. He was drugged by horses through the streets of Alexandria until he died. Luke was hanged in Greece for preaching. John was banished to the Isle of Patmos. Peter, as I said, was crucified upside down. James, the brother of Jesus, was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple. It was about a hundred foot fall. He didn't die, so they clubbed him to death. Paul was tortured and then beheaded by Nero. My point is this. As Christians, we don't believe that Jesus came back to life simply because the Bible says so. We believe it because Matthew said so. And Mark said so, and Luke said so, and John said so, and Peter said so. 
And James said so, and Paul said so, and they were so committed to the message, they were willing to die for it. But I want you to understand something. It wasn't always that way. None of these guys actually believed that Jesus was going to die and rise from the dead until they actually saw Jesus rise from the dead. I mean, think about it. These guys we've been talking about, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, these are rock star saints. These are the big, the cathedrals are named after these guys. Cities, St. Paul, Minnesota, named after these guys, right? I mean, kids used to be named after these guys until you young parents got so weird with, with naming your kids. Young guy playing keyboards this week, his name's Kiefer. I was in the green room with him. I said, Kiefer, you could never have been an apostle. <laughs> apostle Kiefer doesn't sound right at all, does it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, Kiefer. You can't do that. You cannot make that work, right? Your young parents, it's like you get those little magnetic letters, throw them against the refrigerator, and say, yes, we will call him Shmew. <laughs> Gook. We will call him Elizabeth. You know, and... Don't know why I'm talking about this. <laughs> Except it's the 114th time I preached this weekend. But My point is, these are amazing men. Rock star saints. But here's the thing. Not a one of them was standing outside the tomb waiting for Jesus to come back to life. And walk out of that tomb. In fact, just read the Gospels. When Jesus died, every one of these famous saints scattered and hid. They lost faith. None of them expected him to come back to life. But let me tell you an interesting story. After Jesus died, there were two men. One's name was Joseph of Arimathea. The other's name was Nicodemus. And they went to Pilate. Remember, Pilate was the one who said, yeah, take him and crucify him. They went to Pilate and they said, please give us permission to take his body off of the cross. Pilate gave them permission. They took the body of Jesus. Now, understand, when they got the body of Jesus, they didn't take him home into, to Nicodemus' house, go to the man cave, prop Jesus up in the recliner, put a pair of sunglasses on him like weekend at Bernie's, right, and wait for Jesus to come back to life. They didn't do that. They didn't put him over in the corner and say, let's start preparing the welcome back Jesus party. They didn't begin the resurrection countdown clock. They didn't do that, and it's because even though they were believers, they were followers, they saw him die, and they just automatically assumed that he was going to stay dead. So they took his body to a tomb. They prepared it for birth. They put it in the tomb, and they went home. Why did they do that? Well, that's what you do with a dead body in the first century, right? Now, we just got back uh, from leading a trip to Israel, and I, I hope you guys will go with me next year. A lot of people say, um, are, were you, you scared? Was it dangerous in Israel? Did you know starting February the 19th for a 20-day period, in that 20-day period there were 23 mass shootings in America? A mass shooting has to have at least four people shot. 23 in 20 days, and people want to know if I was nervous in Israel. I'm like, moving to Israel. Every fourth person is a soldier with a machine gun. I have never felt safer in my life, right? <laughs> but anyway, we were in Israel, and the last day we were there, we, we visited the tomb that they think may be the tomb of Jesus. And they actually have something to base it on. But before we do that, i got to show you a picture. That's our guide. His name is Joe Armstrong, which means nothing to you. Except in 1973, he was the publisher of Rolling Stone magazine. Okay? Eventually, he became a Christian. In other words, he accepted the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. He died on the cross. He was buried. And three days later, he came back to life. Now that he's retired, he, he leads this tour in the garden there. And he had the best line. He said, in 1973, I was the publisher of Rolling Stone magazine. Now every day I get to talk to people about the most significant Rolling Stone in the history of the world. Right, right, right. <laughs> Great guy. You can't really see it behind me, so I have another picture. Right behind me was that. People believe that was Golgotha. And then what was called the place of the skull. Jesus was crucified, the place of the skull. Now let me tell you why this is so significant. Within 50 yards of this, within probably 50 to 75 steps of this, there's a tomb. There's Laura and I in front of the tomb. You can see the stones there. That's where part of it collapsed. It's limestone. They had to put that there to keep it. But many people believe that this was actually the garden tomb. Now, archaeologists have dated this garden where the tomb is back to the first century through wine presses, different things that they have found there. But this is what's interesting. This is what John 19 verse 41 says. At the place, at the place where Jesus was crucified, Golgotha, right, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. I tell you what, there's something about walking into a tomb and thinking, maybe, could it have been, right, right? Now, it may or may not have been the tomb. But we do know this, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus to a garden right by where he was crucified, and they placed him in the tomb, and they did it because they believed that he was dead. And they believed that he was going to stay dead. They believed that the party 
was over. Nobody expected a resurrection. In fact, Luke 24 tells us how some of the others that were close to Jesus responded to his death. Look at verse 1, chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. Now, why did they do this? I'm going to speculate here, read between the lines. This is not in the Greek. I'm thinking they know that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea have already taken care of Jesus' body and prepared him for death. But my guess, because I know women, these women assume there's no way they got it right. Right? So now they're going to go to make sure it's done the right way. Right? But you got to understand, these are women whose lives have been radically changed by the teaching of Jesus. So if that's the case, why are they even bothering going to the tomb? Why don't they just wait for the three-day period up so he'll come? It's because they saw him die. They believed he was going to stay dead. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, see, it never crossed their mind that he had actually risen. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, classic line, why do you look for the living among the dead? And these ladies are thinking, because he's dead. That's why we're looking for the living among the dead. He's dead. We saw him die. The angel continued, verse 6, he's not here. He has risen. Remember, do you remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Do you remember him saying that? And they're like, no, we don't remember that at all. And it's because every time Jesus brought it up and hinted that this was going to happen, they were like, la, 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 la. Because, see, in their mind, he's the Son of God. Nothing bad happens to the Son of God. Of God. Verse 8. When they, the women, came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. They told it to the apostles and to the others. And I told you, Luke was into detail, so he lists the women for us. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they, these rock star saints, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. So the women come running up and say, guys, you won't believe it. We went to Jesus' tomb. There's an angel there. They're saying he's risen. He's risen. And the apostles are like, you guys are idiots. It was ludicrous in their minds that this could even happen. Nobody expected. Nobody was waiting outside the tomb. But yet, this is what is undeniably true. These same people whom by their own admission lost faith and scattered. This same group of people who thought it was over. This same group of people who thought that they had been deceived. This same group of people went out and spent the rest of their lives telling everybody they came in contact with that Jesus died and he rose from the dead. So here's the question you got to grapple with. What happened between, it is nonsense, and the decision to spend the rest of their lives spreading the message of the resurrection? Very simple. They saw him. And when you see a dead man come back to life, see, that's going to change everything. In other words, see, these men and women, they didn't die for what they believe. A lot of people die for what they believe. We were just reminded in Brussels this week. People will strap bombs in themselves, and they're willing to die for what they believe. A lot of people will do that. They didn't die for what they believe. They died for what they disbelieved and then began to believe once they saw the resurrected Jesus. That changed everything. That's why the, the resurrection was at the center of their message. It's because on one amazing day 2,000 years ago, they were eyewitnesses of this incredible event. Now, that should be encouraging to you if you're a Christian because it means that the foundation of your faith, people laugh at you, the foundation of your faith is an event in history. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It is a verifiable event in history. In fact, we just got back from Israel. It is the most supported ancient event in history. And I'll tell you why I say that. It's because we don't get this piece of history the way we get most of our history. Before I became a minister, I was a teacher, and I taught science and PE, and I taught some history. And I know how we get most of our history, and I don't want to pop your bubble if you're still in school. But we get most of our history. It was written by a historian that was paid by maybe an emperor or a general to write something really good about them, to write something that would make the, them look good. That's how we get most of our history. But you got to understand, this came from men and women who experienced it. And then they paid the price for it as they spent their life spreading the message of Jesus that he was crucified by Rome, but he was raised from the dead through the power of God. And some of you are like, yeah, Mike, I don't get that. I don't get that. You you came in here not getting it, and you're a long way from getting it. In fact, you're only here because the hot chick at work said she'd go to lunch with you, right? If you'd come to church. 
That's why you're here. Or you know your mom's going to call you in the next day or two, and she's going to say, did you go to church on Easter? And you don't want to make your mom sad, so you're at church, right? But the idea of the resurrection, I would challenge you to do this. You're smart. You're a smart person. We have a book that we're giving out this weekend. It's called The Case for Faith. Anybody that's not a believer that's interested in taking one of these books, it's our gift to you. It's written by Lee Strobel. He was a, he was a journalist in Chicago. His wife came home one day, and she said, I've become a Christian. He was furious because he was an atheist. And so he began to pursue to disprove Christianity and the process of trying to disprove it. <laughs> yeah, he became a follower of Jesus Christ. And now he's put his life story into what he discovered. And we'd love to give that to you so that you can continue that journey of researching and discovering for yourself. But maybe you're here this weekend and you've, always, you've also, always, also always rejected the possibility of the resurrection. But maybe this weekend's different. Maybe there's, this week there's, there's something inside of you that's saying, well, it could be true. You know, it could be true. Maybe this is the weekend that God has opened the eyes of your heart and the lights kind of come on and it's clicked and you think, well, you know, I think I get it. I think I get it. Maybe this is the weekend you are finally ready to cross the line of faith and say, you know what, when it comes to the possibility of having a relationship with God and good gracious, where I'm going to spend eternity, from here on out, I am not going to depend on my heritage. I'm not going to depend on my good works. I'm not going to base on how good of a person I can try to be. I am placing all of my trust in Jesus' death on the cross for the payment of my sins. I now believe that Jesus died for me, and three days later, he came back to life to prove that what he said is true. If there's never been a time in your life where you've made that declaration to God, in just a second, I'm going to lead you in a prayer so you can make that declaration this weekend, because I do not want you to go through another Easter season without having the opportunity to tell God that you believe that Jesus died on the cross, and when he died on the cross, he didn't just die for sin, that he died for your sin. And today you're going to accept the gift of forgiveness through his death on the cross. And when that happens, God will go to work in your life. Just like in Jay's story, Jay's on staff here at the church, great young man. But just like in his story where he took that piece of rough wood and turned it into this beautiful bowl. God will take you on as a project. Philippians 1, 6, he who begins a good work and you will be faithful to complete it. And he will actually turn you into the person, not that he wants you to be, yeah, that's part of it. But the person deep down inside, you also want to be. A person with purpose purpose with hope and kind of as a cherry on top when you take your last breath and die you'll get to go to heaven and spend all eternity with a loving God it makes all the difference in the world and how you live life today Friday night at the six o'clock service a woman walked in and she hugged me and she said I just want you to know my husband passed away at one o'clock this morning I said, wow. I said what are you doing at church she said we were supposed to come to this service he would want me to be here she said he's in heaven he's fine I'll see him soon. Wow. Don't you, don't you want that kind of peace? Is she torn up? Yeah. Is she heartbroken? Absolutely. But there's peace and there's hope because of what God made possible through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Nothing magical about this prayer. But it does tell us in the book of Romans that if you call upon the Lord's name, you will be saved. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if this comes from your heart, if you mean it today... God will hear you. God will forgive your sins. God will restore you back into a relationship with him. And from this time on, your eternity is secure. You could get hit by one of these crazy buses walking out of the parking lot today. And you'll be good to go. If that's where you are today, just repeat this prayer to yourself. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he is the savior of the world. And I receive him right now as my Savior. I believe that when he died, he died for me. I believe he took the penalty of my sin on himself. I believe he was buried. And I believe he was raised on the third day. Please receive me into your family. Not based on my efforts. Not even based on this prayer but based on my faith in what you did on my behalf. Thank you for forgiving me for all my sin. I declare today that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for this amazing day. Now I'm going to pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that 2,000 years ago, when those ladies showed up the tomb, it was empty. 
It makes all the difference in the world. If we could find Abraham's tomb, it would be occupied. If we could find Buddha's tomb, it would be occupied. If we could find Muhammad's tomb, it would be occupied. But if we were to visit the tomb of Jesus, it would be vacant because he rose from the dead. Thank you for that event in history that changed the world, but not only changed the world, has the power to change our lives. I thank you for those who've made that decision today to follow you. And I pray for those who are still on the journey that they will arrive at that destination quickly. And we thank you for what you're going to do in all of our hearts and lives. In your name we pray. Amen. What an incredible message.